Welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. This is episode 43. It is October 11th, and you can tell I am not outside. I'm inside. There's the clock. 7.30, and my week, weekend, week has gotten away with me a little. I've been, I, if you had tuned in, I think two episodes ago, I talked a little bit about time and well, the concept of time, and I've really been trying to work on my relationship with time these days. I guess I feel like I've been battling it, and I had listened to this great On Being interview with John O'Donohue, who was a Scott Irish poet, and um, as well as a philosopher and priest and uh, writer, <clears throat> and he was talking about time and how we choose to engage with it. So I've been working on engaging with time in a much different way, <laughs> but uh, I'm still working on that relationship. So all of that to say that somehow my perception and, and what time I have tends to feel harried these days. And so I haven't really been able to pull myself together with really good thought. <clears throat> and I think part of that is because I've been traveling so much and so, well, I don't know. And I'm rambling now, but I'm not going to start the recording over again. So all of that... Uh, to say that I don't have any show notes. It's kind of another here we go kind of episode. I'm going to include works in progress and I have a finished sewing object I'll talk to you a little bit about. And I thought a couple things um, to talk about with Shackleton and I'll address that as we move through. So if you're not interested in Shackleton, that'll be at the end of the podcast. <clears throat> and of course you can edit as you wish. So I'm going to move right into works in progress, and I'll talk about ideas that struck me um, as we move through, and hopefully those they'll be jogged by whatever topic is coming up. Because I had a lot of thoughts. I listened to a lot of podcasts <clears throat> over the last two weeks, uh, audio podcasts, and when I'm listening to them, I'm I'm driving, and I I have these reflections and I want to say something or I want to bring that into the conversation and of course then it's exit you know 187 and I don't even remember what it was so let's hope that I can pull some of that out so I'm going to start with there's there's no finished objects I don't think so I'm going to start with the talisman shawl by Lucy Haig and I've made a little bit of progress on this I was going great guns. Um, we had a fair bit of rain two weeks ago, and I wasn't able to make it to school. I was down at my parents in the south, and I wasn't able to... I had car trouble one night, and then I the rain was so bad, I just decided to, to stay home and sit tight. And so I did um, quite a bit of work on this particular project then. So this is knit with a 20 percent alpaca, 80 percent wool blend I got from Northern Solstice Alpaca Farm. I'm looking at the label and the tag on the yarn and it actually says Alpaca Center of New England. So I'm not 100 percent sure if in fact this is from their farm or if it was a product as part of a cooperative they belong to. So anyway, um, and it's just a beautiful oatmeal-y color, color. So the talisman shawl, for those of you that might be listening or looking down at your knitting while you're watching, is a cabled shawl, a network of Celtic cables. And it's going to be a triangle-shaped shawl. It's not a full-on circle shawl. She has a variety of stoles and full-on circle shawls, but this one is just a half, half circle or triangle. I'm not sure which. So, and... Um, can see my felt pelt right behind me. We've moved it inside and we're loving it. All right, so that is here. I did finish the sleeve component of my cockatoo bray, which was a gratifying moment of progress. And I don't know why I need to show this to you. Um, so I'm knitting cockatoo bray by Kate Davies. I'm sorry. Let me go back to the talisman for one more second. I'm knitting that, I believe, on a size US 7, which, who is prepared, is a four and a half millimeter. And let me just double check. I did shift 
the recommended needle. Oh, nope, I'm knitting it on a US 6, four millimeter. Because uh, I tend to be a very tight knitter. And with those cables, whew, I can yard down on some yarn. So, this is the bottom of Kate Davies' Cockatoo Bray. I'm knitting this on a size 3 US, which is a 3 and a quarter millimeter. I know, it's brown yarn. You're like, don't even bother, it's brown. I'm knitting this with Starcroft Fiber, which is Nash Island. It's brown and my lighting is bad. So, if you're listening, you're not missing anything. Um, this is Starcroft Fiber, and this is their Tide Base. And yeah, I'm just trying to make some progress. Actually, in, in, I, I, in, obviously, okay. What I'm trying to articulate is that, in fact, what I thought was going to be a bit of a, of a slog without grog has turned into, you know, hardtack with water, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, so for those of you, hardtack is um, kind of a staple. Uh, I always think about hardtack kind of in like, you know, the 19th century ships, whaling ships, and being in the doldrums and eating this horrific hard bread and uh, running out of water. So I don't know if that's because my mother showed me the movie Moby Dick with Gregory Peck when I was like six, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't know. I hope, uh, so this is, uh, actually knitting up much quicker. All of that to say, this is knitting up much quicker than I thought it would. Now I'm knitting this in tandem with Claire of New Hampshire Knits, who is actually finished. Yeah, you heard me finished her cockatoo bray. And, uh, and she showed me a sneak peek. I think she posted a sneak peek on Instagram as well of her color work. My color work is going to be, so the whole sweater is knit in the round and it's steeped. It's a cardigan and it has a traditional Fair Isle yoke and with a um, snowflake and pine cone. And these are my colors. They are similar to the colors that Kate chose, but they're not uh, as bright perhaps. Or seem with a little, little um, neon, for lack of a better word. I'm just using that to kind of uh, juxtapose these. These are just a little bit more, they're a little warmer versus, I don't know the word. So this will be just at the top of the, of the yoke. Oh, rats, I forgot to, I wanted to bring down something I had gotten. Maybe I'll pause and go get it. Oh, this goes in here. So that's what's on the needle. Oh, that's not the only thing on the needle, Sarah. The other thing on the needles is the Celtic Myth Shawl. And the woman who designed that, her name eludes me. It is a free download on Ravelry. And I am knitting it out of Upton Yarns, 3-ply Coopworth, in the Ferns Watch colorway. And that's not going, the light's not going to do this justice but it is a beautiful twilight purple. It is named for my sweet fern, and uh, who was a guard dog for years uh, for my Icelandic sheep. So I called it Fern's Watch because this would be her, her time to go out. And so again, it's kind of just a beautiful dusky purple. And all I'm doing right now is increasing for the shawl, <clears throat> which will be, a basic crescent shape, stock in that crescent, and then a knitted on Celtic cable edge. So like I said before, there must be, I don't know what's going on with the cables and myself, but. So that's all that's on the needles. So I forgot to tell you something. There was some spinning that I had done. I forgot to tell you about the spinning, and I forgot to tell you about the Welford Pearls podcast, which I discovered. So they go hand in hand. So I will tell you a little bit about my spinning and then I'll tell you a little bit about the podcast. So this is the Lester Longwell I bought at Maryland Sheep and Wool, uh, not this past one, but the year before. And I washed it in the lock 
actually I scoured it in the lock and then I combed it and spun it. My plan with this is I'm spinning it on the fast flyer on the Lendrum, so a very high twist and I'll be spinning it with a low twist ply because I want to kind of retain that some of that structure within the yarn. In fact, I'm not really sure if this is going to show up on the camera as, much, as, as I would like it to, um, but we'll see if, if the camera will focus. Is it focusing? Maybe? No. Well, you can at least tell that it's gray. So this is my sample skein, and I plan to knit Helen Stewart Pebble Beach shawl with this. I think the luster and the drape will work beautifully with that pattern. <clears throat> I'm spinning this as it comes off the comb. Um, I'm spinning it cut end to tip end. So um, it's coming off the comb with the tip end, and then when I pick it up to spin, I pick it up from the cut end and I spin so, towards the tip end. I still need to comb more of this and I really love to comb so that's no bother. It's just finding time and of course time has been a uh, running theme. I've been putting a lot of mileage on the Nash Island fleece that I have because I can just pick that up and go. This I've been combing a series of nests, spinning it, combing a series of nests. So it requires a little bit more of a couch of time to do versus just sitting down and do something. <clears throat> so I was really inspired to get going on this project by the Welford Pearls podcast. She has picked long wool as a topic for this year. She is a podcast that focuses quite a bit on spinning and she spins all sorts of fleece breed specific fleas, hand dyed um, braids. So she does the gamut. So it's a very attractive podcast because um, unlike perhaps mine, because <laughs> uh, she, she has a lot of things going on. There's color, there's natural color, there's prep, there's spinning. So I would highly recommend you going over to check out Welford Pearls, even if you're not a spinner. She talks a lot about the content of the fiber, the medium that, we're, that we work with, and what to expect from it. She also talks a lot about how to spin some of those hand-dyed um, pieces. And so you can look at how color evolves within yarn. So anyway, I would recommend going to check her out. She is out of British Columbia, and I believe she's available on iTunes and YouTube. On YouTube, I believe she's under Rachel Smith. So... Anyway, so that is my last bit that I forgot to tell you about, and yeah, so I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode, and I'll see you soon. Now, I have some things in the works. One thing I wanted to mention was I am planning to participate in Knit British and this uh, Breeds Watch Along. I would encourage you to go over, if you're interested in participating, and look at her blog post. It's um, exceptionally well-organized, and she has a lot of information on how to participate and what you need to submit, etc. So, I, and I'm not going to go through all of those um, stipulations, but go ahead over. The blog post is very clear and easy to follow, and I would recommend that you do that. And the the premise of it is um, you can or you knit, can knit with breed specific local wool to your environment, your your locale. So I've decided I'm, I'm probably going to knit maybe two swatches. I might, I might knit three. I'm going to knit Hardwick. I'm going to knit a North Ronaldsy just because of my Orcadian connections. And I'm going to knit a um, a swatch of a Hardwick improvement program that's happening in upstate New York. And Hardwick, Hardwicks, I don't know. I'll, I'll link their name in the show notes. I've been in contact with her over email. And she will be at Rhinebeck if you are planning to go. But they're not 100% Hardwick. And their history is on their website. And I did not write it down. I am planning to interview her, I hope. And that will give you more information about their breeding program. But I thought it would just be really interesting to take a look at that and look at the authentic 
Herdwick or the 100% Herdwick and have this local piece and have the Herdwick piece and get to, you know, get to try those two. And I don't know what else may cross my path for that Breeds Watch Along, but I think it's going to run through November. I don't know if it has a deadline. I don't think it has a deadline, but I know that she's using it as a springboard for November and discussions for November. So for more information, tune into Knit British it's, um, and, and take a look at her uh, blog post. And if, I mean, just tune into Knit British just so you can listen to her talk. Between her and Joe Milmine of the Shiny Bees podcast, who, by the way, just won a major award for most engaged audience. Congratulations to you, Shiny Bees. Uh, I would probably give my left toe to be able to talk like either of them. Somebody happened to comment, and I haven't done introductions in a while, and I will. I just can't remember where I left off. Uh, they commented that they might, that they enjoy listening to my voice. And, um, and I was like, wow. Cause whenever I'm over in Orkney, uh, they always kind of, they don't make fun of me like in a spiteful way, but they like to tease me a little bit about my very nasally A's. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. Um, and I don't know how to, uh, mimic their American accents, what they think I sound like. But it never sounds good, and so I'm always a little bit like, oh, man. Uh, you know, I listen to Curious Handmaid. She's Australian, and Joe, and Knit British, and Chrissy. They always just sound so, I don't know, authentic. And then there's nasally old American me. So, anyway, where was I going with that? Can't even remember. Oh, the swatch along. So, anyway, I have plans in the works for that. I wanted to throw that in here just to keep it on the radar as people move um, into the Shackleton long, along or you know are interested in exploring more opportunities to work with different breeds. I know that one um, person mentioned in the Shackleton along that they're going to participate in the breed swatch along as they prepare for their Shackle Shackleton along project trying to figure out what fiber to use for their project they'll do this so it was a really nice um, marriage of those two uh, kind of challenges isn't the right word, but in my big congratulations, I am wanting to talk like all of my British counterparts. I forgot to mention, of course, that Helen Stewart of the Curious Handmade podcast won a major award as well in Britain. I think it was an international conference. I didn't quite get all the particulars on it. I know it was about media and blogging and podcasts, but there was a lot of hurrah and huzzah for um, having these knitting podcasts sweep all of these awards um, over gamers and, excuse me, uh, other such, other hobbies and crafts, like knitting. So anyway, a big congratulations to both Joe and Helen for their hard work and uh, for putting knitting on the media map. So the other thing I wanted to mention is this year at the Fiber Frolic, one of my viewers met up with me and she gave me this great gift which is a paperweight and it is a picture of her relatives wool and carding and spinning um, mill in Phillips, Maine. And it's a great old photo. When she gave this to me, <clears throat> she said I was supposed to check out the left hand corner, <clears throat> that there was something odd about it, something out of place. And I haven't figured it out yet. And it's kind of Halloween time. So I thought, I'm going to try and put this up to the screen and see if you can see. And, I mean, the detail is going to be hard as it is. But I wanted to include you in this bit of spook. Uh, and so, here it is. Supposedly, it's in this corner. Let's see if that camera will focus. Oh, what? That close? Yeah, it may not get enough. If this thing is really heavy. So, I've been listening to this new podcast it's called Lore. I believe it's with Aaron Mankey. Mankey. And some of them I shouldn't listen to. Because they're, they spook me out. And it's not like uh, horror but some of them are about lore, or you know, the, the origins of our monsters and scary tales, vampires, werewolves, elves, etc. And some of them are about 
like 19th century axe murderers. And those are the ones I'm always like, skip, but I can't help myself. I have to listen to this crazy ongoing, you know, the, the goings on of, um, of that world, quote unquote, very strange. He has this one called the bloody pit and it is so good. And it is set in upstate New York. And in fact, it has to do with a group of Cornish tin miners. I know. So that, I would recommend that one. It's called The Bloody Pit. Uh, and they are based on true stories. Some of these ghost stories, some of these um, 19th century stories. I haven't heard anything modern day yet, uh, which I would probably skip. I, I like the old stuff. I like ghosts and goblins. And uh, he had a really nice episode about elves and the hidden folk. And I would highly, highly recommend it. It's called Lore. But anyway, this thing has been sitting here and I've, you know, been trying to figure it out. So I would like to know, and you know who you are, if you want to give me any hints or tell me. So it's been sitting here and I've been thinking about it and looking at it. What else? Okay, let's just do this. Let's, I'm going to show you my finished sewing project. This is the Alabama Channon tunic. And I know it's not gray. It fits me perfectly. And when I mean, when I say perfectly, I mean Rob has to help me get it on and off. <laughs> I can't get it on by myself. And I thought I had knit the appropriate bust measurement. I mean knit, I had sewn the appro appropriate bust measurement, but for some reason this thing ended up being like a 34. I know, and I'd cut the pattern for a 40-42 because I was like, it's supposed to be sewn in a jersey cotton, but I did it, of course, in a woven in hopes of creating a template for a linen project. So I was like, well, I'll knit, I'll give myself that much ease. Well, it didn't work out that way. So anyway, I can put it on. It's finished. I learned a ton with this project, so I don't regret it, but I... I definitely need to improve my sizing and figuring out how to size things appropriately when it comes to sewing. This is just a batik I picked up at Joann's. And then I, um, it's like a blue, if you're not picking up that color, but it's more tealy blue than that. It looks like copper, like copper patina. And then I just did, um, what's that called? Bias tape, just because I wanted to finish it and I was getting frustrated. So that's kind of it for fabric and fiber. And I think, I think I'm good. I have two things for Shackleton. One is watching that thread unfold is so amazing. I had noted, I'm not sure if I talked about this last time, but we had a member of our group sister who went to Ireland and ended up at the in that Tom Crean, who we talked about two episodes ago, excuse me, um, he asserted an inn when he retired. And she ended up at the inn, but didn't know her sister was participating in the Shackleton along and sent these pictures. So that was this crazy synergy. Then another viewer was on vacation and met this couple and he had worked in Antarctica and that's where they had met and ended up she was the filmmaker behind the PBS documentary of the Shackleton voyage. So all of this Shackleton energy is running around. Then I read on the thread that uh, Knitting Traditions, I think that's what she said, Knitting Traditions just did um, a whole thing on Arctic explorers and South Pole explorers and their knitwear and et cetera. So uh, was I, I, think, I think I said this last time, I was like ahead of the wave, no pun intended. And people are really talking about these kind of epic events and journeys and the knitwear and um, the designs that they wore um, in that time frame, because wool obviously was available. Oh, that was the other thing. Um, one of the followers on Instagram who was at Shetland Wool Week, knife in my heart watching Instagram and Shetland Wool Week unfold, uh, she posted a picture of a letter, I think it was from Shackleton, I couldn't quite tell, but somebody had written, to the wool brokers, thanking them for supplying them with woolens from Shetland for the, for the voyage. How great is this? 
So anyway, I just love watching all of this unfold and I've really enjoyed watching people shift and move through their projects and watch those evolve. And I know we're in this for the long haul, for like the 18 month long haul, and I know that there have been no prizes promised. I have one lead on one prize though, just so you know, Granny Sheep and I. But I thought what I would do is I would do some morale boosters. So I'm thinking I would like to draw next time I podcast for a, a Shackleton morale boost, and I'll just draw from the chatter thread, and if it's me, then I'll just redraw. And yeah, we'll see if we can just boost some morale. We are smooth sailing, as I always say, because we don't leave for South Georgia Island until after October 26th. So there has been some chat in the thread about doing a little protocol detour to Falkland and maybe picking up a little project to do some uh, Falkland spinning, which would marry beautifully into the breed swatch along if you are so inclined. And I'm thinking I'd like to do something with that idea as well. I just, I, I'm, just got, I just read the post, so I'm just starting to let it percolate a little bit. So we will have a little port of call in Falkland, and then we will be in Buenos Aires and on October 26th, like I said, and then we will be shoving off. So I don't have any Shackleton-esque chatter um, as far as history and uh, interesting stories. I'm kind of trying to save that up because we haven't really got to the story yet. And so I thought what I would do is start to do more of that after October as they move um, across the ice and start to encounter some of their, their challenges. But I'm going to read a little poem, one of my favorites. You can look forward to that. It'll come right up at the very end. And I, it's been how long since I opened that Agatha Sock thread? I'm gonna leave it open. I'm gonna leave it open. So what am I talking about? Because I, sometimes I never pr provide context, which is hard to believe because I'm studying to be a speech language pathologist. It's all about context and, and I teach and I taught history and it's all about context. So the context for that comment is Claire of New Hampshire Knits has published her first sock design and it's the Agatha socks. It's named for a chicken. I think it is a chicken who is kind of a march to the beat of her own drummer type, which seems, you know, appropriate for at least this podcast and the Shackleton project. And she is giving away a free pattern and we have a thread in the Ravelry group. By the way, I have a Ravelry group. And if you go over to the Ravelry group and you are a member, please tell us what you would knit those socks out of and I will enter you into the drawing to win a free copy, which Claire will manage after I do the draw. So that's kind of exciting. And there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Ravelry, group, oh, textiles and time. Next time I podcast, which will be post Highlands on the Fly, which is coming up uh, next weekend, or this weekend, it's the one that's coming towards me in time. I, um, I am going to do a te another textiles in time. I've been very Shackleton focused and that's mostly because I've been just so enthusiastic and, and feeding off of your enthusiasm and I've been really excited. So I will do some textiles in time work. See if I can pull that in. I've got an exam out of the way, a case report out of the way, dig out a little bit of, carve out a little bit of time to to do some other exploration and not just talk about Shackleton all the time. It's been Shackleton all the time. So here. I think with that, I'm going to bid a fond farewell. I don't really have any enabling, but stay tuned next time. It's going to be crazy. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I think I forgot to say at the beginning how much I appreciate everybody who's reached out, which I always say, how could I forget to do that? Anyway, if you've stuck around this long, thank you so much for all the connections through Instagram and Ravelry and Twitter and Facebook. I really appreciate um, that greater community that we've been able to build. And yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to get the poem queued up and I'll see you next time. Bye. It might be a little hard to make 
a connection here with Shackleton and Robert Service. But there's so much fun. I really wanted to bring Robert Service into the conversation because I feel like, well, A, he's a fun poet. He's fun to read out loud and listen to. I grew up listening to him, my dad reading him to me. And I feel like he really captures the feeling of some of the work we're talking about, the experience of Shackleton. And while I don't want to trivialize his adventure, I do want to correlate some of the same things that we're experiencing. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Robert's service. He was born in 1874, and he died at the age of 84 in 1958. And I feel like this, I'm, I'm on the robertservice.com homepage, and there's an obituary that appeared in the Pittsburgh Sun, Sunday Telegraph uh, regarding this poet. And it says, he was not a poet's poet. Fancy Dan Dilettants would dil will dispute the description great. He was a people's poet. To the people he was great. They understood him and knew that any verse carrying the byline of Robert W. Service would be lilting, would be a lilting thing, clear, clean, and power packed, beating out a story with a dramatic intensity that made the nerves tingle. And he was no poor Garrett type poet either. His stuff made money hand over fist. One piece alone, the shooting of Dan McGrew, rolled up a half a million dollars for him. He lived it up well and also gave a great deal to help others. The only society I like, he once said, is that which is rough and tough, and the tougher the better. That's where you get down to bedrock and meet human people. He found that kind of society in the Yukon Gold Rush, and he immortalized it. So that's just a little insight into this particular poet that we are going to um, listen to. I've not picked either the shooting of Dan McGrew or the cremation of Sam McGee, which are both really fun, as I said before. But I am, in fact, going to dedicate this to all the Shackleton-esque Shackletonites that are working away on their epic projects. This poem is entitled The Quitter, and it's short. And I used to read this to my students when I taught high school. And I will read it slow in hopes that I don't mess it up. This is The Quitter by Robert W. Service. When you're lost in the wild and you're scared as a child and death looks you bang in the eye and you're sore as a boil, it's according to Hoyle to cock your revolver and die. But the code of a man says, fight all you can and self-dissolution is barred. In hunger and woe, oh, it's easy to blow. It's the hell served for breakfast that's hard. You're sick of the game. Well, now that's a shame. You're young and you're brave and you're bright. You've had a raw deal, I know, but don't squeal. Buck up, do your damnedest and fight. It's the plugging away that will win you the day. So don't be a piker, old pard. Just draw on your grit. It's so easy to quit. It's the keeping your chin up that's hard. It's easy to cry that you're beaten and die. It's easy to crawfish and crawl. But to fight and to fight when hope's out of sight, why, that's the best game of them all. And though you come out of each grueling bout all broken and beaten and scarred, just have one more try. It's dead easy to die. It's the keeping on living that's hard. 